joining us. We're excited to bring you the first in a series of webinars hosted by Mission Essential, IO Observations and Insights, a conversation with General Tony Thomas, as interviewed by Major General Clay Hutmacher. The integration of technology and human expertise has long been the focus of Mission Essential. IO is a key component of global security today. The type and diversity of threats demand ongoing development and training. Mission Essential is the largest provider of language services to DOD. We completed over 100,000 missions, 20,000 linguists in 83 countries, and 400 current personnel supporting soft worldwide. We hope that this conversation will inform and inspire you. I'm privileged to introduce General Tony Thomas. General Thomas recently retired after three years as Commanding General for the U.S. Special Operations Command. As a commander of SOCOM, he oversaw 85,000 troops and civilians deployed in over 100 countries. In his last two roles leading globally deployed forces, General Thomas increased the focus on cyber and information operations. He was one of the first military, one of the earliest, military earliest and staunchest advocates for applied artificial intelligence on the battlefield and was the first senior officer to appoint a chief data officer to bring private sector solutions to the community. Today, General Thomas is a venture partner at Lux Capital, which invests in emerging science and technology ventures. I'm also privileged to introduce Major General Clay Hotmacher, who was a career United States Army officer and retired in 2018. He served 40 years in uniform. He has an extensive special operations aviation background, serving at all levels within the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment. And as the commanding general of the U.S. Army Special Operations Aviation Command, today, Major General Hotmacher serves as the president and chief executive officer of the Special, special Operations Warrior Foundation, which empowers and families of fallen and wounded special operations forces. Welcome to you both, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you for your service and for your continued support to the soft community. Major General, the con is yours. Hey, Brian, thank you very much, and, uh, and thanks to General Thomas in advance for, uh, for taking the time to join us. Um, you know, as, as you stated, I, uh, I spent my, uh, the majority of my career as a special operations aviator. Um, and as, a, as an attack helicopter pilot, uh, kinetic operations were job security for me. Uh, you know, it's what I did. Um, and, uh, and so I was very focused on that mission. In my last assignment, I was a director of operations for General Thomas at US SOCOM down here in Tampa. And when I got here um, in, into this joint environment, really operating at the strategic level with the joint staff and the Department of Defense and our interagency partners. Um, my view of uh, information operations matured uh, considerably and rapidly. Um, you know, I saw from, the, uh, from my seat the impact of information operations and actually in how we could have a great operation that was brilliantly executed in accordance with all the rules of engagement and everything else, but it could be completely negated by a poor follow on information operations plan following uh, that operation. So I became very interested, interested and respectful and appreciative of the impact of information operations on our future and that I personally believed um, that, and I know General Thomas feels very similarly, that this was the future, that information operations needed to get elevated. Uh, we needed to put more talent against it, and we needed to get ahead of that curve uh, to deny our adversaries this space, which they uh, then, and in my opinion, in a lot of areas, continue to uh, dominate, uh, dominate that area. So uh, a very, uh, a interesting uh, topic for me that I'm personally interested in. And with that, I'll pass it to General Thomas for him to give his uh, an introduction and some opening comments. Thanks. Clay, thanks for the intro and, and thanks uh, to the team for the opportunity to be here today. I had to laugh at your initial comment uh, where you describe yourself as an attack helicopter pilot, and that was the sustenance of your, your livelihood. Uh, I come from a similarly kinetic background, and, and you and I have been painted as being overly kinetic, uh, reality is that's what we're brought up to do, to close with and destroy the enemy. Um, and so that's tangible. It's something you understand. It's intuitive. Um, but it took me, and I'll acknowledge uh, you know, easily now, it took me too long uh, in my uh, career development 
to really appreciate, to your point, that the best operation that you could ever conceive and execute uh, can be misplayed if you don't own the narrative. And we, live, we have lived that uh, for many, many years in the uh, counterinsurgency fight in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other places. Uh, and it's only going to get harder as our adversaries uh, are steep in this competition uh, going forward. Um, I, I can't overstate the criticality of, of uh, information operations and our need uh, to, to compete. Uh, we talk about the elements of power uh, being uh, dip diplomacy, information, military, and economic. Arguably, uh, the D, M, and E are the levers that we can pull on any given day and, and hopefully synchronize together. Uh, but the information piece is what wraps it all up. Um, and, and arguably, uh, both a source of frustration for me and a source of optimism for the future, arguably we have not been well organized, we have not been coherent. My source of optim optimism is we can be, we could be, and I hope we will be in the future. So again, thanks for the opportunity to be here uh, with you all today and, and to discuss this critical topic. Hey, thanks, sir. Um, I'm going to start off with a series of questions and, uh, and, and, uh, and follow up as appropriate. And I'll add, you know, my thoughts as well after I ask you a question. But I'd like to start with, you know, the battlefield is constantly evolving. You know, how important do you feel information operations are today uh, and also in future conflicts? Yeah, Clay, you would, you would have thought we'd learn this lesson over time. Uh, but I think it's come back to reinforce, uh, be reinforced uh, very compellingly in, over, the, over the last uh, few decades. I just finished watching Ken Burns' documentary on Vietnam, and, and you, you consider how the North Vietnamese uh, were very, very skillful um, at leveraging uh, the vulnerability of the United States, and that was open source uh, efforts uh, to bring the war effort uh, or to criticize the war effort and to, and to uh, put a different spin, if you will, on what was actually happening there. Uh, and, and the classic quote uh, that you, you North Vietnamese uh, uh, seniors would acknowledge later on is that you may have won every battle, but we won the war. We won, we won the overall effort because we, we own the narrative. You flash forward, and ironically, you know, the, the conventional wisdom uh, back then was we're never going to fight that kind of fight again. And we found ourselves, you know, a decade and a half, two decades later, into a very, very similar fight um, and feeling very good about ourselves in terms of the, the, the operations that we're conducting. Uh, but time and again, uh, whether it was a strike or a raid or, or you pick the type of mission that we conducted, um, it would be misplayed very, and you got to give props to the, the adversary very uh, well uh, by just filling the space in the immediate aftermath uh, of one of our operations. I think it was a stroke of enlightenment, albeit late, uh, for us to partner with our host nations, be it the Iraqis or the Afghans, to make sure they owned the narrative immediately following our operations, to inform them so that they could get ahead of uh, any recriminations that came up. But we, we, we did not do that early on and, and we suffered accordingly. Um, so again, we've got some really potent lessons learned, uh, both historic and current, uh, and then, you know, whether or not we acknowledge it right now, uh, we are absolutely getting clobbered in the information space uh, by the peer adversaries that we've acknowledged in the form of China and Russia. They are running circles around us right now. Um, luckily, you know, not, not uh, to our downfall, uh, but they're, chip, they're, they're chipping at it and, and, uh, and we, we better acknowledge it and, and come up with a way to, uh, to, to compete in this space. Hey, thanks, sir. Um, a follow-up question there. What do you think the role, our, what role do you think our coalition partners can play in uh, future uh, IO operations? And if you can, you know, maybe give some thoughts on where you think we're at today. And then what are some of the challenges we have with working uh, with partners? Um, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, it's, um, we acknowledge our, the criticality of our partners, you know, intuitively, and then we find every way to defy the relationships that we benefit from over time. Um, we as Americans are an inherently insular country. We're, we're blessed. We have natural borders. We don't have to go abroad. Uh, we have almost everything we need here uh, locally. Um, yet we're that great experiment that, you know, that light on the hill that, that does try to project our values um, uh, and our way of life to others who, who uh, 
uh, may or may not embrace it. Um, our, but our disadvantage is not knowing the cultures where, where we're involved, not knowing the language most practically. Um, and so how we leverage natural partners, and I, and I, I think I mentioned to you recently, I, I was dismayed a couple of years ago that we were inclined, uh, we were acknowledging the challenge with Russia, we were also acknowledging that we had lost some core capabilities in terms of uh, analysts and linguists, but then we were uh, hell-bent on buying back that capability produced and manufactured, so to speak, locally. And my immediate thought was, wait a minute, the world has changed. Uh, in my lifetime, folks who were formerly adversaries are now part of our coalition, our, our, our NATO structure in this case, uh, between the, the Baltic countries, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, uh, Romania, Poland, etc. And so instead of thinking you had to develop language capability and cultural insights locally, leverage the partners who are right there and who are now part of your team. And as a twofer, they're more integrated into the effort. Um, you think of the Australians in the, in the Pacific and others who have just naturally, you know, natural uh, advantages um, that we should leverage on every occasion, but not leverage in terms of abusing or, or uh, misusing partner relationships, but reinforcing the criticality of, of working together. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, I, you know, I would add that, you know, from my optic uh, was that I thought, um, you know, the early days of Iraq, we made some quantum leap forwards in working with our partners and, and information operations is one area, but you know, security uh, concerns always stymied us. You know, everything was secret, no foreign, no matter what. And I think we were not perfect. And while it, it still probably lags behind where we would like to see it, I do think we're on a positive trend line there with, uh, with we're able to communicate in a meaningful way in a classified environment with our partners. Glad I have to laugh. And you, you and I were teammates there, but uh, when I was the Sajidif commander in Afghanistan, when we, when we brought all SOP together, literally under one tent, uh, in my jock, I had a Polish chief of staff, form their, their SEAL team, you know, the special mission unit equivalent. I had Ukrainians, I had Greeks, I had, you know, just the, the entire smattering, you know, the Star Wars bar, bar, bar scene, as we like to call it. Uh, but in our jock, we had special mission unit feeds because that was a subordinate activity. Um, although, you know, we knew the sensitivity there, but we needed that information to integrate what we were doing. And uh, I'm still waiting for the IG investigation to land in my lap for violating all those security classifications you talked about. Uh, but reality was we thought we were right and righteous in that there was a need to know amongst the team of all the things that were pertaining to the problem set, our, our, our shared problem set. So uh, you're right, our, our security classifications have a tendency to, to overly restrict our ability to, to deal with our adversaries. And, and I'm glad to say we chipped away at that over time, but there's still, and you and I lived it when we were at SOCOM, how many times is you as the J3, would you have a coalition partner coming in, come in to say, I know you're doing something. In fact, I, I probably know enough about it that you're not telling me, but why won't you tell me? Or why am I excluded from this meeting? Uh, is there a good reason? And we'd have to sit there and go, oh, well, uh, let, let's see if we can't rectify that, but that's the way we've operated for too long. Yes, yeah, sir. I, I would agree. That did make for numerous awkward conversations for both of us, I suspect. Um, you know, another question. Uh, how, you know, how, where do you think SOCOM's at on uh, information operations? And what I mean by that is where we're at today. You know, we started out with sort of generic messaging, what I would say, inform, information ops and, uh, um, and that whole piece of our business was ponderous to me and was always shooting behind the duck. You know, we were, we were so um, concerned about getting everything perfect that it had to go through multiple layers of approval before we could respond um, to, to an enemy activity in this space. So where would, I would ask you, where do you think we're at today? And then where do you think we're at as integrating operations into, um, are how we conduct warfare. You know, how are we integrating that? It's just, you know, a, a, another operating system to use a, a bit of an antiquated term there. Yeah, Clay, you, you and I lived it 
Um, and it was, it was cliche. It was a joke. I guess you, you, you make jokes of things rather than cry about them. Uh, but it might uh, be interesting, if not uh, demoralizing to some of the spectators today, that the, the cliche we used to use, that it is easier to shoot a hellfire at somebody than it is to conduct either a cyber operation or information operations, was in fact true. Um, we could do raids. We could launch a mission and, you know, to kill somebody uh, more easily. We had the authorities and, and, and the freedom to do that. Uh, but both cyber and information operations were just laden with uh, ridiculous restrictions, which, again, I, I thought were, we had outthought the problem um, or we hadn't thought the problem more thoroughly. Um, I'm, I am upbeat that, that across the board, and I, and, I, and I mean this in terms of a United States government uh, kind of uh, a universal sentiment is, we must do better. Uh, we must have unity of effort uh, you know, for our USG endeavors going forward. Unity commands a little bit of different challenge. We can talk that separately. Uh, but in that recognition, uh, right at the tail end of, of my command time, um, the Department of Defense mulled, who could we, should we have leading this effort? <laughs> and humorously, it took them about a year to consider, hmm, we need a global combatant command probably is the best lead for this. We probably need somebody who has information operations as a core capability. And we knew this was, we at SOCOM knew this was all being considered up in DOD. But finally, about a year later, after they consider all that, they said, boy, SOCOM seems a natural to be the coordinating authority to try and bring all this together. And so that, that authority was actually given to SOCOM right at the tail end of my tenure. Um, I was really excited about uh, what it would enable us to do to help the team, not necessarily to own, you know, own the mission or necessarily own the, all the resources. A fascinating anecdote that uh, I think the fo folks will find, uh, you know, again, uh, pretty enlightening, was a little bit of tension between us and our great partner at Cybercom, and it, uh, it was uh, Paul Nakasone specifically, as they were delivering their extraordinary world best capability uh, they made a play to own all of our MISO capability, our military information su uh, uh, support operations, because they wanted it integrated in, in their cyber approach. And I had to have a, a, a very frank discussion with Paul to say, well, Paul, we're the designated lead. We don't have enough MISO capability. So, you know, uh, critical mass, center of gravity is, is kind of critical here. Uh, and oh, by the way, we have cyber capability. A lot of people didn't realize that we had organic cyber capability. They thought we outsourced it all to Cybercom. So it, it just plays to the point that we all know we need to do this. We all know it needs to be integrated. There's not enough resources to go around. So how do you task organize uh, to get after it? And I think that goes to your integration question. And the good news is, and, I, and I, I'm humored by the number of people that don't appreciate that cyber and IO are as integrated as any other aspect uh, in our approach to mil military operations. They, they take it for granted that we've got maneuver and fires and the normal functions down. Uh, but I said, hey, cyber and IO is not an afterthought for SOF. It's not something that we strap on after or have to outsource for. It, it, it has become you know, absolutely integral to our approach to, to all of our operations. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hard pressed to think of the exception. Yes, I agree. You know, thinking back while you were talking at the tactical level, um, when I was the uh, deputy commanding general at the Army Special Ops Command there at Fort Bragg, um, we had um, we had moved from three separate tribes. You know, we had we had special forces, civil affairs, and psychological operations, all doing great things, but not coordinated. And I uh, I think that a a, um, a critical piece was to get the structure right, the force structure. When they put everything under First Special Forces Command, now you have one, and I, I, you know, and I think they're still evolving in how to do those, um, you know, to integrate, but having one boss and having them under, you know, all was a critical piece forward. So a Special Forces team has the right complement of information operations capability as well as civil affairs. But that was an important, I didn't realize it at the time how important that was, but now looking back on it, I think he, there really is, you know, that force structure component that is a piece of that. No, I agree completely. Again, and, and not, it, it drives two then following considerations. 
Uh, how much do you need? How do you task or you know train and, and prepare that? And, and then how is it integrated into, into the organizational structure? Yes, sir. Don, I think maybe uh, in a related topic for sure, but we just acknowledge both of us, at least for our own personal opinions, that uh, information operations are critical and, and their role is growing on future battlefields. How do you see that impact in the military with regards to force structure, resourcing, talent management? You know, what, I mean, I know that's a broad question, but you know, how do you see that? Because it, it is a paradigm shift, right? From our core capabilities, whether it's Rangers or Special Forces or aviation. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a shift for us, which is always, is not always, in my opinion, been front and center on the, uh, in the Special Ops community. Yeah, I think we have to acknowledge, and it, it, it may uh, poke some folks, that uh, the information operations career field was always a secondary field for, for the, the, the folks that participated many of whom were incredibly talented at it, but it was not their initial entry uh, you know, uh, occupation. It wasn't their formative years. Uh, they migrated to it. Point being is that we acknowledge the importance of it, but we really don't groom folks to, you know, you know, to be you know, consummate professionals in this field. The other part that I, that I think over time we've gotten better at is this is absolutely commander's business. Um, and, and I think too many commands as I grew up would consider, hey, it's that IO business, it's a sideshow or it's a, you know, a side effort, a complimentary effort instead of, no, commander, this is as important as anything you're doing from a maneuver or fire standpoint. Um, you know, are you owning, you know, kind of controlling the, uh, owning the reins or controlling the reins uh, as, as aggressively as, as you need to? Um, it does challenge us going forward in terms of uh, type classifying who, you know, what are the prerequisites for information operations specialists? We have a, from time to time considered PAO uh, career fields as the automatic crossover. I don't think that's, I think that's a little bit of apples and oranges. You know, there, there, there's some related aspects there. Um, so uh, how we more to clearly define infra op, information operations expertise and qualifications uh, will be key going forward. The other part will be uh, yeah, and, and it's, it's on us already, so how the military adapts is the role of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, as it's integrated into this field. It, it's, it's here now. Um, you know, uh, adversaries are already adapting and, and leveraging that capability. How will our professionals be similarly um, you know, capable to, you know, to compete? Yes, yeah, sir, and I, you know, and you alluded to it earlier, um, it came up during our tenure, uh, uh, the Department of Defense, the CAPE office, uh, pretty much told SOCOM they come up with a plan uh, to develop this. A, what we initially called the Messaging Counter Messaging Center, and a, the name was changed later to a Joint uh, Meso Web Ops Center, uh, which rolled. Um, but, uh, you know, I saw that as recognition at the highest levels of the Department of Defense that we needed to get better in this space. And I also, um, along with you, I, I completely bought into that and I made that a priority. You know, that belonged to the J3 for the, uh, initially there. And, uh, and I thought it was absolutely what we needed to do as a military. And, you know, and that I've always taken great pride that special ops led the Department of Defense in developing new capabilities on a dynamic battlefield, whether that's ISR or whatever. And this was just the latest uh, version of that. And I thought this joint Meso Web Ops Center uh, that we were, you know, that and I, we got the green light to develop. And there was some, like, you know, said, there was some tug of wars with Cybercom and, uh, and, and a few others. Um, but I did think that was a, uh, a critical step to get that, authority along with funding to develop this capability and I you know I'm removed from it now but I'm glad to see that we are marching down that path to mature that capability and you know it gives me uh, it makes me very optimistic that at least at the SOCOM level we've bought into it and there was some initial cultural pushback you know um, because it was a departure from what we would see as normal operations for us but I did think it was a a, a critical step in the right direction and, and long overdue. Yeah, Clay, it's, it's unfortunate the name that came with it and uh, uh, not of our choosing, Joint MISO Web Ops Center 
<laughs> ironically for for an entity that's designed to be smooth and coherent in the information space that's the the clunkiest most awkward uh name but it was assigned to us it came from on high uh but i i, I was very encouraged um in the cape discussions that they emphasized the global nature of this challenge and the need to compete globally as opposed to uh, our typical approach and again most laymen don't appreciate uh, that we, the United States of America, from a DOD standpoint, play a six-man zone, you know, if you want to use a sports analogy, across six regional uh, geographic combatant commands. They are all great people. They're all great organizations. Uh, but this is a 1940-something construct that uh, divvies the world up into six separate slices um, that gives a very parochial and myopic uh, slant at their particular part of the world. So, for instance, UCOM vis-a-vis -vis Russia, indo pacom vis-a-vis -vis China. And you can think both those adversaries are A, global and have, you know, frontages that are outside those respective uh, GCCs. Uh, but CAPE recognized that I, we, we just can't put this in individual courts. Our concept was to have a global um, uh, coordinating activity. Again, not owning necessarily anything other than resources and the, and the requirement to coordinate across these GCCs, but ensure we didn't suffer from gaps and seams and boundaries that uh, kick our tail, uh, you know, almost every, every other given day. Um, I, again, I was so excited about this thing. I, I saw over time that a SOCOM that had a, a joint operations center, but as you know, we, done, we did not conduct operations from SOCOM other than very exceptional uh, activities that required extra, extra scrutiny. Otherwise, it was powered down to our operational arms but this was one that i thought did require a socom operational uh if, if fusion function uh that would ensure global integration global synchronization uh, uh, you know across across the planet and and so i was very excited on how it would play out i know it's still uh, a work in progress uh lots of pushback as you know not only from outside dod but inside you know people thinking that we were going to somehow subsume their activities. My first question was, what are you doing? It's, it's, it's invisible or, or you know, uh, ineffective from my standpoint, uh, but not going to overwhelm your activities. In fact, I would just prefer to tie them in and see if we can improve the product as we go. So um, again, uh, real opportunity for SOCOM. I'm, I'm hopeful that, that uh, the team can uh, help at least the DOD be better, much less the rest of the United States government. Yes, sir. And I, and I got two follow up questions. One, uh, uh, not too controversial, but the follow on what maybe a little bit, um, you know, our adversaries are using the 24 hour news cycle to their advantage. Do you think that and, and that includes social, not only the, you know, the media, but social media as well in the, in the various forms, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram. And I'm, I'm, I'm at the end of my understanding of uh, social media there. But um, <clears throat> do you think that this, uh, again, joint MISO Web Ops Center will give us, uh, will allow us to operate? I, my sense was I envision that as a 24-hour capability. Do you, do you see it the same way? Oh, and then some. I think it's 24 hours and then hyper-enabled by machine learning AI approaches. Um, I, I, interesting as I was what, either reading Future Wars or some other publication, uh, the Chinese have already been getting reps in terms of automated generation of, of news articles. They did it in the Olympic venues where they could spit out a very accurate to a 90% plus degree news article covering, uh, you know, an athletic event while other normal old school reporting uh, systems would be... <laughs> crafting them you know these you know through through humans um and it, it just it was an eye-opener in terms of uh of capability that uh was already available and already you know already being applied by uh by some of our adversaries you mentioned social media i i think again for you you and i folks of our age uh we think we appreciate uh what's you know what's going on in the web yeah, and I, uh, I i i had to laugh that it wasn't until i was a one star um, that I felt compelled to even dip my toe into social media because my boss, the chairman, uh, was, he wasn't in Twitter at the time. I think, I forget what he was, what uh, social media he was involved in, but I felt like a dummy. I felt like an ignoramus that and my boss is in, in that space. He's accepting the risk. 
uh, not so much what have I got to lose, but I, I need to I need to accept some risk here and try it. Uh, and and as you and I have both experienced, the potency of social media platforms is almost indescribable. And 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 um, it's both humorous and concerning. Uh, I was reading a particular entry last night on Twitter, and uh, just the visceral reaction in some of the comments about, oh, this these are bots coming back at you, or this is is whatever source of information. You can just sense the competition going on, you know, actively. Um, that most of most America, and, and even from an institutional standpoint, were blissfully unaware or or afraid to compete there, and that's the that's the that's the competitive venue. No, sir, I I agree, um, and I couldn't agree more with your uh, with your thoughts. Obviously, um, one last question on this, and then I want to I want to really dig a little deeper into uh, technology and its impact and where we see that going in the future, AI, machine learning, and the like. Um, but, you know, taking it up a notch. So, you know, we've both uh, seen instances where the authority lies in one, um, uh, with one of our interagency partners, but the capability lies within DOD. Civil affairs is a perfect example of that. Uh, I think of, you know, nation building type activities, which, you know, the military has long said, hey, that's not our deal. Uh, long, you know, and that belongs to the State Department, but clearly they rely on DOD to do a lot of that. So, you know, in, with regards to information operations, so who should own it? Yeah, that, that is the the most profound, uh, I'd, I'd say challenge, not just question, but challenge for the United States. So let me let me, let me try and uh, shape that answer a little bit. One, we used to be really good at this. And so another historical example, the Cold War, Voice of America, our approach to Russia, there were a couple outliers, but almost uh, uniformly, the United States had its stuff together and through allies. So it was it was a solid front, uh, the, the adversary was clearly identified. No stone, stone was left unturned in, 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 in terms of pushing the themes as well as reacting as, as need be. Um, we unfortunately spiked the football at the one yard line at the end of the Cold War thinking, well, that's we won that one and, and, and never have to deal with that. Those guys again, you know, enter Putin, you know, come back, uh, you know, the Chinese certainly resurgent. Um, so we're having to rediscover that, uh, hey, we used to be good at this. How do we get it back together? Uh, you mentioned that cer certain folks have authorities. Fascinating vignette. Um, I was literally there at the birthing of what is now ca called the GEC, the Global, Global Engagement Center at State Department, which some people think is a recreation of Voice of America and or efforts in those regards, although not at all resourced to the level it needs to be. Uh, the birthing that I like to consider was back in 2009. I was a one star on the joint staff. I was attending a weekly counter-terrorist uh, update to the President of the United States, uh, Barack Obama. Uh, and the briefing in this case, I had briefed my, I told my boss in the read ahead, um, sir, this is all State Department. This is the State Department angling to try and get $5 million, a whopping $5 million uh, to start this new activity. And the briefing was provided by Ambassador Dan Benjamin, who was the state CT ambassador. Sitting right next to him was Hillary Clinton, and sitting further down the table was uh, Leon Panetta. Why is that important? Benjamin started off by telling the president how, you know, anecdotally how we were not doing well. And you could almost see President Obama fuming. You know, it, literally, you could watch him getting a little more incensed as the briefing went. And finally, he cut it off. And these sessions were usually somewhat familiar. This is the, the cabinet. I mean, it, it was people who worked together and in most cases liked each other. But in this case, uh, President Obama's comment was, Madam Secretary, not Hillary, Madam Secretary, why are we having this conversation a year after we had it the first time? We own the, mil we own the media, we dominate the media. Why can't we you know, control the narrative? And, and you know, on my side of the table, the, the national security side of the table of DOD and, and others, we thought, well, wow, this briefing's not going where it's intended to go, but it got worse. The president then turned from the State Department side of the table to the, my boss, the Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, and the chairman sitting right next to him and said, Bob, easier for me to get you $5 billion than it is to get state $5 million. Why wouldn't we give this mission to DOD? 
and there was a, a you know a, a physical reaction on our side of the table people pushing back saying this wasn't our briefing we didn't want this mission you know, go you know, talk to them well the, again the fascinating i'm sorry i'm going long here but the fascinating backstory here that we all found out about three four days later was a note from then director cia uh, leon panetta to the state to the secretary of state hillary clinton cc dan benjamin you have to consider what those people, how they first met in a previous life where it was chief of staff of the White House, first lady, and a speechwriter in the White House. Um, and Panetta's letter said something to the extent of, Hillary, great lunch with you, with you the other day. What we need for this fight, and he was talking about the ideological fight of counterterrorism and counter-ISIS, back then it was counter-Al-Qaeda. But what we need for this fight is a campaign, quote unquote, uh, his terms, a campaign like headquarters. And, and when you think about it, he was saying that as a former politician, a chief of staff, but it's exactly the kind of animus and focus that we need where what we hate about you know, politics and the cycle that we never seem to get out of, but is the, the, the essence of political campaigning is they're always angling for their guy or girl to get them elected, leaving no stone unturned, 24 seven effort, always you know, banging the themes at you, it, you know, it's irresistible. And that's what he was advocating for and what we don't have across it, a USG front. So the GEC was established a few years later. Again, it's, it's under-resourced, it's undermanned, uh, and, and they've kind of limited themselves. In fact, they'll tell you they don't do public affairs, which, which to me, it, it, you're, not, you're not competing. Enter the evolution of the SOCOM initiative now that DOD gave to us, um, and somehow we've got to merge that over time. Uh, my, my constant discussion with them, and I visited on a few occasions, was, hey, look, uh, we represent the 100-pound, you know, the 800-pound gorilla, DOD. We've now been given the lead. We don't want to crush you or overwhelm you as we integrate. So what, do, what would you like us to look like? Uh, but there's still, you know, a, an art form in terms of the balance of the, uh, the two activities above, uh, among others, because we're not the only ones, state and DOD are not the only ones playing in this space. But how do we coordinate over time? The USG, because we're a democracy, are, are, are really um, uh, you know, handicapped just from a standpoint of having that coherency, that unity of effort, unity of command, vis-a-vis -vis totalitarian regimes. I'm not, I'm not saying they're better, but they have an advantage when they're just saying party line is, and it is literally the party line, this is what's getting jammed your way. You could, you could offer COVID as the latest example where the United States has the most disparate approach to COVID. The Chinese are solid. The Chinese right now are very solid. Um, you know, they, I think they sense some vulnerability and they're firing back hard, uh, but it's a, it's a great uh, case study or contrast of, of two approaches. No, sir, I agree. And I think you, know, you made the comment uh, earlier um, about never gonna have unity of command. I think that's a bridge too far. Clearly, we've never been able to achieve it across outside of the Department of Defense, for sure. But I do think potentially in unity of effort is possible. And uh, it, when, when we were getting this capability, when we were tasked to develop this capability, this Joint Meso Web Ops Center, um, when I was the three, I went out of my way to engage with the GEC, you know, the Global Engagement Center, and cybercom within the department of defense but also in the intelligence community to be open kimono and big tent and that you know we and and I, largely i think that was very well received that we weren't making an you know we're not making an end run we're not try, trying to establish a position of dominance but to get collaboration and cooperation it's still a work in progress but um uh, you know i i do think we had the right foundations going forward that with, with some cooperation, and a lot of that is, especially in the nascent stages, is dependent on personalities, right? I mean, you get along with that person and you tend to cooperate and collaborate, but you know, as you know, people move on. Um, if if on that, along that line, if I could, you know, it, it's challenging enough to get our own you know, stuff together, uh, but when you wake up in the morning and Duterte has said something that's 180 out, or Erdogan has said something that's 180 out, ostensible allies, um, and how you synchronize the message still uh, relative to those two countries. And then I think the fascinating uh, current challenge for anyone in this space is, you know, you have to acknowledge the most influential, uh, uh, you know, information operations entity for the United States right now 
is in the form of the commander in chief across the Twitter space. Um, it, I'm not making a political statement. It is, it, but it is, it resonates everywhere, left, right, up, down, across the globe. And so as you're trying to synchronize state and DOD and these other entities, um, you have to keep pace with, with the individual in this case who is as prolific um, and dominating the, you know, the information space as anybody else. And, and you've, we've seen where there have been uh, you know, sources of friction or sources of, of uh, discrepancy among, our you know, among the messaging there. So, uh, and I don't think this is a flash in the pan. I think uh, you know, the, the current president's uh, leverage of social media uh, and you could argue that his predecessor was adept, uh, you know, uh, not as not as active, not as uh, you know visible necessarily, but they they uh, had a tendency to leverage social media as well. This is not a passing fancy or phenomenon. It's going to be there you know, for the foreseeable future. How do you integrate across that? Um, and it's twenty four seven real time. Yes, sir. I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I'd like to shift a little bit to the role of technology plays in information operations. You know, as Brian pointed out as in, in his introduction, you know, you saw the need for a chief data officer as part of SOCOM, which was, uh, as far as I know, a first, uh, clearly. And, uh, and I, I clearly, I, I think that has helped us. But, you know, what are your thoughts on machine learning AI in the IO space and, 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 you know, now and where we go in the future with that. Yeah, if you, if you all didn't see uh, this last weekend's New York Times, uh, there was a piece on Eric Schmidt there, um, and yours truly was prominently displayed, but, but, but uh, I, I, I didn't like the fact I was essentially clickbait. Uh, long story short, uh, Schmidt visited us back in uh, summer 16. I've been in command for about three months, uh, spent a day with SOCOM, and on the way out, decided to give me a report card. And he, you know, Eric Schmidt doesn't lack for any self-confidence. So he said, hey, General, or imagine us riding in a suburban down Bayshore Boulevard. He said, General, uh, I got to give you props. You have exceptional people. You really have talented people in SOCOM. And I thought, check if you took nothing else away. That's, that's, a, that's the key takeaway. Um, he said, secondly, you, you, you uh, prototype pretty effectively. I thought, okay, yep, we've been failing fast long before I ever heard that term. Uh, and then he went on to say, but you suck at machine learning and, and predictive computing. Uh, and went even further to say, if I know you live in a very complex world, but if I got under your tent for more than a day, I think I could solve most of your wicked challenges. And that was the headline in the New York Times article. I could solve all your problems uh, with advanced algorithms. And he might have said quantum computing, but by that time I had completely turned him off and I was ready to boot him out of the suburban. Not real, not literally, but I mean, I, I was, I thought, where, where, do, where do you get off never having touched the complexity of, of warfare to say something like that? Luckily, Admiral McRaven engaged him from the front seat, and it gave me a chance to pause and think about it. And, and even in that time frame of 2016, it struck me immediately that he's absolutely right, um, that we do not have enough analysts to get at all the data that we're trying to deal with. We're lucky that they're hustling like crazy. They're the best analyst money can buy, but there's just too much info out there. How do you sort through the, you know, literally the wheat to the, you know, uh, get the wheat from the chaff here, uh, or that, you know, that gold in the, in the, in the haystack or the diamond in the haystack. And, uh, and so that was my epiphany. And I give Schmidt credit. I didn't like the way he delivered the message, but I give him credit for waking me up to something that was of interest, but became a passion for me. Uh, as you mentioned, we hired a chief data officer to get at, uh, you know, to help enable SOCOM to be a, Data enabled command, you know, uh, and a machine learning enabled command. Um, you look at the applications in the private sector right now that are, you know, un unfortunately way ahead of us, um, and and you, and um, and arguably, you know, our adversaries are, are in a similar way getting a lot of reps early on here, and and uh, and they're not caught up in all sorts of righteous indignation that, ooh, we're going we're going into machine learning and AI, and it's automatically going to go to Skynet. No. You know, you can, you can control the pace of things, but, but you, better, you better compete. Um, so, I, I, again, long story long, I, I just think there's incredible potence, you know, potency and, and potential with uh, AI-enabled approaches to this particular problem, sorting through the data, ensuring your themes are getting hit. You think of on any given day how information is germinating around the world. How do you see it all in the first place? How do you know how it's trending? 
um, relative to the messages that you're that you're uh, pushing out there? And then how do you respond on the bad day on on the, on the one offs that, that that happen all the time? Um, you you can't get enough analysts to get at that problem, and and a lot of companies are already doing very well you know, privately. I think we just it's a matter of us uh, leveraging leveraging them. No, sir, I agree, and I think you know bringing a chief data officer on and uh, and embracing uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is uh, you know within the special ops community will also lead to uh, I think similar acceptance eventually uh, with the services and will you know and across the uh, spectrum of operations so you know, there's that piece of it. There's the AI, which, uh, you know, uh, is critical in the machine learning. I would like your thoughts on, you know, with regards to IO, the importance of language, uh, cultural awareness, cultural skills, and cultural expertise, you know, in the special forces community. And again, I'm, a, I'm an aviator and thank God that aviation, the universal language is English. Um, and because anything beyond uh, uh, that is challenging for me. But, um, you know, the special forces community, as you know, invests heavily in language skills, rightfully so. And I think that is a, a key part of their um, mission set. But, and, and I, and, you know, and there's, there's accept, awareness, you know, acceptance in uh, that that is a critical piece. Uh, for them and their mission um, to work with foreign partners and things. But what are, you, what, what are your thoughts? That level of cultural awareness and I.O. when you're on those spaces in the language are critical skill sets, I believe. And I would like your thoughts. Yeah, Clay, I, I feel blessed that, uh, that I was uh, enabled with a really, really broad international experience base before I took command of SOCOM. Uh, because it, I think it helped me try to represent a, a global perspective um, as I looked at problems. Uh, having said that, again, through formative years, we, it struck me we were always chasing languages and chasing culture. And when I say chasing languages, I can remember at the end of the 90s, you and I worked this together. Our mission for the month, and actually it, took a, you know, it was our mission for a couple of years, was to go over to Serbia and, and roll up bad guys who were war criminals. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you took stock early on and, hey, how many night stalkers and how many special mission you guys can speak Serbo-Croatian, the answer was zero. Uh, actually, there might be one or two guys, and you and I knew of guys who were incredibly talented on a C-17 ride across the pond, could literally get literal in, in Serbo-Croatian where, you know, I could say dobro dan by the time it was all, uh, you know, said and done. Um, but we would, and so we were sure we were going to have to, we were on the side when we weren't, uh, when we were on alert, we were taking Serbo creation lessons, German, because it seemed to be universal in that environment, but we were sure we were going to be talking those languages for the rest of our life. 9-11 happens. So all of a sudden we say, oh my goodness, you know, looks like we're going to be speaking, uh, Pashto and Farsi and Arabic here. How many, you know, organic speakers we have and special forces, as you mentioned, did have some organic capability. Uh, but even some of those guys will tell you, hey, I, I passed, you know, I, I, I did the necessary quals, um, but I wasn't getting the reps every day and I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't think I was going to be using it. And to your point, they weren't culturally immersed. Um, they hadn't lived there. They didn't know uh, the environment um, at, you know, near well enough. They could speak, but, you know, it's almost as awkwardly. Uh, I went on exchange to the Mexican military academy. I used to let, I was 3-3 in Spanish for a while, but you know you're getting rusty when you're trying to transmit and they finally say, okay, let's just speak English. You're, you're too painful for me as you're trying to speak your language. Um, so, you know, that, that ability to bridge is so, so critical. We've been, we've been lucky to have, you know, incredible uh, interpreter, uh, you know, uh, talent uh, in the formation for, for a while uh, and continue to need it uh, going forward. It's going to be challenged similarly by, Offerings that uh, that the machine learning community, and specifically language rec or voice recognition, is going to is trying to bring to bear that hey, you can pop up in country X and talk to your uh, app, and it's going to translate. I would you know check on that one because you know there one try your English voice recognition and see how many times it warps what you say into into the written language all the time for me. Uh, I like it, but it's it's not anywhere near 
prime time unedited. Um, and so uh, language skills, uh, critical, but the cultural wrapping uh, from someone who's been there, lived there, maybe grown up there is, uh, you can't put a price on it. No, I agree, sir. And uh, along that line, you know, when we were build, you know, we were coming up with a force structure for this joint NISO web op center. You know, we're looking at it, you know, there, there was clearly a large military contingent, but more in the leadership roles and things like that. And we, we envisioned a huge contractor um, in this because, and like you uh, pointed out, you know, we have all, all of us have individuals in our formations as we were growing up that had unique skill sets and languages and, uh, you know, backgrounds. But, but it wasn't by grand design or the, the military. It was just, we just, they just happened to end up in those formations. And, and you know, what we realized with regards to language and, and, and that, that high level of cultural expertise, it's going to be, in my opinion, difficult if not impossible to maintain that within the with a military person regardless of what um, uniform they're wearing so I do see that there's a, a real partnership there with with contractors or civilians that are filling that cultural expertise role and we integrate that military understanding and intent and purpose and where we're trying to you know it, it really is, is the way I see in the future I don't think we could go it alone no, I, I, I was, uh, when I first got to uh, Mosul, Iraq, I was there for 15 months. Um, I was very, I like to move small uh, and, and just leverage the available uh, talent. So I didn't have a, a personal interpreter for the, and I was a one star for First Armor Division at the time. And I would go from place to place. Um, and, you know, the, 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 uh, both the disparity um, across you know, language capabilities and cultural, uh, you know, kind of, uh, a culturalization, if you will, was stark. You could tell the one, you know, the folks that uh, that could get you into a, a meeting and 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 be value added, and the others were, you almost thought, okay, you're not, you're you're hurting me more than than helping me. Ironically, at, about halfway through my tour, one of the brigades uh, advisory groups went away, and I had it happened to uh, see this young man who was a former Iraqi. Uh, you know, uh, heavyweight wrestling champion. Just, but, but I actually thought he was from New Jersey. He was just that. Uh, he was that gregarious. He, his English was that good. On the flip side of his Arabic, uh, but he uh, he was my secret weapon for almost every uh, key leader engagement that I participated in, where he he could disarm uh, the most ornery provincial uh, governor, mayor. Uh, you pick it, um, but he, he was my go-to guy. Um, I, luck, uh, I feel proud that uh, we ended up getting him a green card. He wanted to come to the United States. He's, uh, you know, he's here in the United States now, and I stay in touch with him, but um, it was just a, it was my secret weapon. No, sir, I uh, agree. In fact, I've actually uh, ran into a couple of them, uh, folks. That one of them was your interpreter, I think, driver. So maybe we ought to look at hiring him in the future uh, year. Uh, one last question, sir, and then I'm going to uh, pass it back to Brian to wrap this up. But, you know, there's a technology aspect to, uh, to information operations, the cultural expertise, the AI and all. But then there's a policy piece to that and authority piece, you know, um, you know, to, to compete in this environment, in this, this very dynamic uh, social media environment. What, can you give me your thoughts on um, how do we need to, is there any changes in how we, our decision-making process of skills, more importantly, you know, uh, policy, right? Uh, what, what, what policies are gonna, are gonna stymie us, do you think? Yeah, Clay, I, great question, because ironically, I think it's, uh, it requires even more agility in times that aren't described as warlike. Uh, in our national defense strategy, we call it competition short of conflict. Uh, I would argue most important to get it right then and to be most agile then so you don't have to go to war. I mean, you and I have spent our lives, our, most of our adult uh, lives downrange projecting you know, U.S. military capability um, at the pointy end of the spear. Um, 
that is arguably a diplomatic failure. That's, that's a, you know, something went wrong that we actually had to go to war in those cases. So this side of that, how do you, how do you enable both your Department of Defense, your State Department, and others to be so active and effective that we don't go to war? Uh, think of the level of brinksmanship we're, we we're playing with right now with Iran could break any way, any day. Um, you don't know. Think of North Korea. KJU apparently is still alive, uh, not quite dead yet, um, but nonetheless sitting on 60 nuclear weapons. Want to get that one right. We don't want it to go south. Um, so yet you have to be in, you, know, you have to be engaged. You have to be working, you know, definitely diplomatically. You got to have the big stick of your military that don't make me use this can of whoop ass. Uh, but how is that message all tied together tightly uh, in this critical phase of ostensible peace uh, so that we don't have to go to a shooting war? Um, our, our government has a tendency to over-regulate and over-policy these things, as, as you mentioned, uh, and that's, that's the antithesis of the, the agility that you need uh, to be effective. It may, in fact, be why the president uh, just has assumed, I got to do this by myself. I, I have to singularly uh, dominate the, the social media space because if I try to get my government to do it, and again, I'm not, I, I have no idea the thought process he's going through, but it may be an acknowledgement that you know, the USG approach is so bureaucratic and so cumbersome that it just won't be agile enough. I've got to do this on a very restricted basis. Uh, but, you know, that's, that, uh, that is the challenge. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, 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 you know, my personal, my perch is the J3 on this, in this space and many others, really. And uh, as it comes down to a willingness to accept of risk, uh, you know, with regards to powering down, you know, I used to tell uh, my, uh, you know, my young officers, I said, listen, you know, um, encouraging initiative and empowering lower ranks means, you know, you got to be prepared to, to take it in the face from higher uh, if they don't. Um, and, uh, and that's, and I think that, you know, holds true in this, in this uh, space as well. But I agree, it really comes down to risk when it's not in a conflict and when there's no smoking gun or imperative to, to accept that risk, bureaucracies, uh, as you know, are, are, are slow to do that. Um, sir, we're, I'm looking at time here and uh, I know we're, we're coming to the end. If, um, if you don't mind, I was going to pass it over to Brian and, uh, and uh, ask him to close us out. And I really appreciate the dialogue. I thought it was, uh, very uh, useful and interesting. And I thought got right to the core of uh, certainly uh, my thoughts on uh, uh, and the criticality of those. So Brian, over to you. Thanks guys. Yeah, no, uh, it's been fantastic, honestly, listening to, uh, to you both. And it's obviously an honor to listen to <clears throat> both of you to discuss such a critical and timely topic, um, obviously, and to learn your perspectives. So thanks again for your, your service, your thoughts, and your time today. Um, and thank you all for tuning in to Mission Essentials' first webinar in a series that focuses on the topics impacting the soft community. Uh, we look forward to you joining us next time. And until then, stay healthy and stay strong, folks. Thank you.